dual-pole signatures. So some recent research have found that a lot of dual-pole signatures in supercells can potentially be helpful in differentiating between tornadic and non-tornadic storms. So I've got my wonderful uh, Microsoft Paint diagram of a supercell here. And I'm just going to go through a quick review of the different dual-pole signatures that we'll be looking at in this uh, study here. So there's inferred hail fall area. So these are areas where you've got uh, ZDR that's fairly low, so usually below 1 dB, and then reflectivity that's fairly high. And that means you've got a lot of spherical scatters that are fairly large, and usually that's uh, an area dominated by hail. And some previous work has found that this hailfall area tends to be larger in non-tornadic supercells than tornadic supercells. The KDP foot is an area of high specific differential phase, or KDP. That kind of indicates that you have really high liquid water content in that area, so very heavy precipitation. This is often found in the storm core, and it's kind of a potentially a proxy for the downdraft location in some instances. The ZDR column is kind of an opposite of that note in some ways. It's an area of higher ZDR, so um, larger, uh, more oblate drops that are lofted above the environmental freezing level. So this is an updraft signature. And it's kind of a proxy for the location of the updraft, potentially its size, and also it can maybe tell us something about the microphysics of that updraft. The ZDR arc is an area of high ZDR again, so large oblate drops that concentrate along the edge of the forward flank in a supercell. And this is due to size sorting by the storm relative wind. So smaller drops tend to fall more slowly, and they have more time to be ejected by the storm relative wind into the storm core, so they often end up kind of in the KDP foot area, whereas larger drops end up sort of uh, left in this area along the forward flank, and you get this nice ZDR arc. So the ZDR arc has been uh, hypothesized work that potentially be related to low-level storm inflow characteristics, so things like low-level SRH and storm relative wind. And finally, the separation angle. So this is an angle between uh, a vector that you draw from the centroid of the KDP foot to the centroid of the ZDR arc and the storm motion vector. And some previous work by Scott Loeffler and Matt Cungeon at Penn State has shown that this tends to be larger, like uh, closer to orthogonal in tornadic storms than non-tornadic storms. So it's potentially because uh, you may have larger SRH in storms with larger separation angles. So you have a better environment for like stronger level methods. So there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered with dual pole signatures. I've got a few of them up here. Uh, we're going to focus on the first one and the last one in this study. So how are these characteristics a function of the near storm environment? And how do these dual pole signatures relate to each other? And there hasn't been a lot of work looking at uh, different dual pole signatures in a large spectrum of environment. So uh, my master's advisor, Dr. Vanderbrookie, has done some work looking at 12 different environments and like clusters of supercells in those environments and basically seeing, all right, do they do dual pole signatures vary more between environments or within them? But there hasn't really been much work looking at a large sample of storms and seeing like, all right, how does ZDR column size vary with CAPE or things like that? So that's what uh, this study is kind of a uh, first attempt at here. So the methods for this, we went and gathered 206 supercell cases so evenly split between tornadic and non-tornadic storms from all over the U.S. during the dual pole era. So in this plot here, uh, the blue dots are non-tornadic storms and the red ones are tornadic storms. So we've got a pretty good geographic distribution. We even got a tornado in Idaho from one of them. And each storm we wanted to uh, make sure we had good low-level data to look at low-level signatures like the ZDR arc. So we kept it to storms within about 70 kilometers of an 88D. And the analysis period for each storm covers the whole time that's within range of that 88D, so within that 70 kilometers. So for the storms here, it's generally between an hour and four hours or so that we had to look at it. Uh, so to get the environmental variables, we then got proximity soundings from the RAP or RUC for each storm. And we tried to put these about 35 to 40 kilometers away in sort of... Uh, guided by some of the other research people have done looking at proximity soundings. There's a pop and all paper from 2010 where they found that's kind of the Goldilocks range for looking at some of these parameters. And we collected these at the hour closest to the middle of each storm's analysis period to represent that analysis period. 
uh, made sure they weren't contaminated soundings, and then we also wanted to make sure they're on the same side of any mesoscale boundaries that we could find as the storm. So we're actually sampling storm inflow. So to actually look at the dual pole signatures and quantify them, we use this algorithm that uh, research group here has coded up that I've worked on a lot called SPORC. So the Supercell Polarimetric Observation Research Kit. And SPORC actually uh, goes through and we've got some graphical output from it here, but it tracks storm objects and then has a bunch of uh, code in there. It's a machine learning fund that goes through and uh, objectively identifies different dual pole signatures and quantifies their metrics. So the end result is that you have these storm objects that you can then pull the dual pole signatures out of and have a time series of each metric. So a time series of like ZDR area or a ZDR column area and things like that. So for all the storms in the data set that we're looking at, we went through and calculated mean and median metrics over each analysis period for ZDR column depth and area, ZDR arc area, tailfall area, and the separation angle. So these are all metrics that have either been uh, shown in some previous work to indicate that both well, be different between tornadic and non-tornadic storms, or potentially have uh, some useful information about the environment. So ZDR arc area is in that category. And then we plotted all of these against different environmental variables, so 29 different uh, sounding parameters, calculated from those rap and ruck profiles using SharpEye and MetPy. And for the statistics in this, we generally use Spearman correlation coefficients and Spearman p-values because we're not uh, super confident that the distribution of any of these things is Gaussian, so we wanted to make sure to use non-parametric statistics here. So getting into our results, I'm just going to preface this with the idea that generally correlations are not uh, often super impressive for individual variables correlated to individual dual pool characteristics because there's likely a lot of competing influences from the environment on a given dual pool signature. So usually your value is like if you've got a value of 0.5, it's often a pretty impressive one for this kind of thing here. So looking at ZDR columns, oh, there it goes. I lost my uh, PowerPoint for a second. So the best two individual variables that seem to control ZDR column size the most are instability. So mixed layer cape here at an R value of about 0.32. And generally speaking, you can see that a lot of times, like there's a ton of scatter, but you do seem to have a bit of a tendency to have larger columns with larger cape. And the freezing level. So in this case, you can see that it's pretty uncommon to have large ZDR columns when the freezing level is very low. There were also some moderate correlations with SCP and STP, so some of the composite parameters, supercell composite and significant tornado. So here's supercell composite, here's significant tornado. And the interesting thing here is that the correlations for these composite parameters were actually a bit better than any of the individual parameters alone. There was also a weak correlation with um, effective storm relative velocity. One of the interesting things we found is that there weren't really any uh, good correlations between ZDR column size and storm relative flow magnitude. And based on some of the work that John Peters has done showing that storm relative flow magnitude is really important in regulating updraft size, we were really surprised by this. We expected to see a higher correlation between the two. So that was interesting. Uh, ZDR column depth, again, these for ZDR column depth, it was fairly similar to ZDR column area. Uh, instability was the best predictor of, of depth. Correlation of about 0.56. It also tended to correlate with freezing level, supercell composite, and significant tornado form parameter. Interestingly, there was little correlation with shear SRH metrics for ZDR column depth. So it was primarily a function of thermodynamics in this case. I'm moving on to hail fall area here. So hail fall area is interesting because you have a lot of cases where there's no hail fall area. Uh, inferred from the algorithm. So the correlations are very, very scattery and kind of wonky, and I, I take a lot of them with a grain of salt here. The best individual parameter was freezing level, which makes sense for hailfall area. The colder it is, the more likely you are to have a larger area of hailfall. So it was a negative 0.4 uh, correlation there. And there are weak negative correlations with low-level shear and SRH and supercell composite. So it seems generally like 
if you have an environment with less favorable low level shear and kind of a less favorable environment in general, you're more likely to have larger scale fault areas. And again, there's also modest negative correlation by the SDP, which matches with that. There were also some weak positive correlations with low-level storm world with low layers, and I just bring that up because uh, it's different than what we saw with SRH. So you kind of expect those two to have the same sign because storm world with flow is an important uh, component of SRH, but we weren't finding that here, and that was curious. So separation angle, as expected, correlated best with low-level shear. So this is surface to one kilometer shear here, and you can see that generally you've got uh, larger separation angles with your um, stronger level shear. And same with SRH, so larger separation angles with stronger SRH. Uh, it also correlated positively with supersol composite and significant tornado parameter, and negatively with uh, some of the thermodynamic parameters, so LCO and LFC. So go through those there. Sorry, if there's an email notification that distracted me for a second. All right. There was also an interesting negative correlation with several storm relative flow layers. So storm relative wind here uh, in the lowest three kilometers, you tended to have smaller separation angles with stronger storm relative wind, which I found to be interesting. Final parameter here, arc area, is best correlated with instability. Uh, it had a positive correlation with freezing level and SCP. So freezing level here, generally speaking, if you have a low freezing level, you're going to have a smaller arc. And SCP, that positive but very scattery correlation here. Uh, it also had a weak positive correlation with some storm water flow layers. And you tended to have larger arcs in drier mid to upper level environments. So it's done with the individual parameters and environments here. Moving on to correlations between different signatures. Let me go through this fairly quickly here. Uh, the kind of kept an obvious result is that column area is pretty well correlated with column depth. So larger columns are more likely to be deep and vice versa as well. So deeper columns are more likely to be large. Uh, hail area correlates negatively with pretty much all of the column variables. So if you have a larger and deeper CDR column, you're more likely to have smaller areas of hail fall, which kind of makes sense because having a lot of hail in the updraft that then falls out may also be masking out some of the ZDR column on radar. And uh, separation angle didn't really correlate to much besides hail fall area, which was interesting. Uh, modest negative correlation there. And finally, arc area tended to be positively correlated to ZDR column area and depth. So if you have a larger, deeper ZDR column, you're more likely to have a larger ZDR arc. Uh, some of these parameters are interesting to look at when they're not correlated in kind of a joint distribution here and see what you can uh, potentially pull out of that. So I'm plotting separation angle here and column area against each other. And it's interesting to look at this kind of uh, parameter space because you can see that uh, when you've got a separation angle larger than 50 degrees and a column area larger than 50 square kilometers, you generally tend to have tornadic storms in that parameter space. And the opposite is true when it's smaller for both of those. If you have a separation angle smaller than 50 degrees and a column area smaller than 50 square kilometers, most of the storms in that box are non-tornadic. So there may be some useful, potentially machine learning applications in here if we can put this into something like ProbSevere or an algorithm like that. So kind of summary and conclusions here. Uh, the dual pole metrics I looked at displayed moderate correlations with individual environmental parameters at best. So there's some influence from the environment, but they may also be telling us more information about the storm itself. Uh, storms in more favorable environments have larger and deeper ZDR columns, smaller hailful areas, and larger separation angles. And finally, this matches up with what we've seen in that same sample, comparing pre-tornadic storms to non-tornadic storms. So the pre-tornadic storms also tend to have larger ZDR columns, smaller hailful areas, and larger separation angles. So some of that difference uh, may just be telling us that, again, these pre-tornadic storms are in more favorable environments. So it's an interesting future work. Uh, there's another guy student that is here at UNO who's looking at tornadic and non-tornadic storms in the same environment and doing those comparisons to see how much of that information from the other side is kind of uh, 
just based on storm differences. And it would also be interesting to look at this in a larger sample and say stratify some of those correlations by individual variables. So look at all like low CAPE environments and see how shear uh, influences some of these metrics in that. So I think that's pretty much what I've got. Uh, and I'll take any questions now. All right, let me unmute everybody here real quick. All right, I um, hope I didn't get too far over time. I lost my stopwatch halfway through. <laughs> oh, no, you're perfect. Um, you're actually under time, so good job. <laughs> oh, some thanks. Of are, some of us are going to blow past our time, I think. So, um, yeah, you guys are all muted. If you have a question, you can unmute yourself now and, and, a, and ask away. Hey, Matthew, this is Aaron Johnson. Uh, thank you for presenting. I'm just curious on that correlation between the separation angle and hail. Um, I thought that was interesting. I, I, to be honest, that was not a correlation I was expecting to exist. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, so I'm really curious as to, oh, I apparently, all right, let me go back to the slideshow here so I can get back to that. <laughs> All right, computer is not happy with me this morning. So uh, some of it may just be explained by the fact that uh, you've got larger separation angles in more favorable environments and smaller uh, hailfall areas in more favorable environments for tornadic supercells. So some of it may just be a correlation where like, if you have a larger separation angle, you'd expect based on the environment to have a smaller hailfall area. But I could also see some of that uh, being a consequence of the hailfall area itself. So if you've got a large hailfall area and some of that area is uh, sort of like occluding the ZDR arc, so you've got like an interruption of the ZDR arc by hail, then that's going to usually be like towards the mesocyclone rather than further down on the forward flank. So that'll effectively move the ZDR arc uh, sort of down shear on the forward flank. And if the KDP foot stays in the same spot, that's going to make your separation angle smaller. So a larger area of hail fall may kind of physically influence the size of the separation angle as well. So there's potentially a couple different things that could explain that connection. Thanks for the question. Yeah, that, that makes sense now. I, I was trying to put that together in my mind and that uh, with the arc disruptions, that, that makes complete sense. Um, I guess, Matt, I had a question. Um, uh, I guess I, this is the first I've heard of the, of the spork algorithm stuff. That looks, this looks really cool. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, is that something that UNL is sharing or anything like that? Or um, I could think of some, it'd be interesting to have that ability here just locally to be able to look at some storms in more objective uh, detail. I know that's something I struggle with with some of the dual pole when I'm teaching it is there is kind of a subjective nature to some of these, some of these parameters sometimes, and it'd be kind of nice to be able to have an objective look at it too. Yeah, that's uh, exactly why we put this together, uh, because it's like going through and analyzing these by hand is tough, especially with things like ZDR columns where it's a 3D signature, and you have to know where the freezing level is. So the code for it is available on GitHub. Uh, it is kind of computationally intensive, so it, like I'll run it on my laptop and the computer is not happy with me. But the code is available on GitHub. Uh, I've got a version that runs archive data. So that's what I use for this. But I also have a version that uh, can run in real time. And it outputs place files that you can view in GR2. So it's kind of a pain because you have to run it locally. Uh, so And I, I also understand that so it, it runs with Anaconda Python. And I know that Weather Services had like some issues with Anaconda recently where some licensing stuff got messed up. So that may make it kind of difficult, but definitely like it's on GitHub. So if you want to uh, try and run it locally, let me know and I'll do what I can to help. Okay, I appreciate that because I, you know, aside from getting these great stats and stuff, I just think that the, the learning potential with that also is, is, pretty, is pretty cool. And uh, it, was, it was always something I was kicking around the back of my head is it'd be nice to have something that would do this. So it, 
I'm, I'm very excited to, to give it a try. I will, I will be looking into that in the, in the near future. Yeah, thanks a bunch. I really should have put the GitHub link in the presentation somewhere. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, no worries. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be, I'll be bugging you later about it. So, <laughs> all right, I guess last call for Matt. Any other questions? All right, well, I'm going to take control again, if you don't mind. <laughs>